Information is physical. Written letters are carbon grains on paper. Spoken words are vibrations of air molecules. Computer bits are electric charge. Each of these examples shares a common limitation. They work under physics that was understood in the 1800s, known as classical physics. Science has progressed since then. We've discovered a new set of laws called quantum mechanics. Here's one of our chips designed to leverage the rules of quantum mechanics to process information in ways impossible on a computer based in classical physics. You may have heard that quantum mechanics only applies to microscopic objects, like atoms. So how does this chip bring out quantum behavior? I'm Daniel Sank, a research scientist working in the Google AI Quantum Computing Lab. In this video, we'll look at how our quantum bits are made physically. I want to explain the fundamental differences between classical and quantum information at the physical level so that you can understand why our quantum bits are made how they are. Physicists and computer scientists both think in terms of states. A physical state could be my position. I can be on the left or on the right. And physical laws determine how nature goes from one state to another. Observe, if Sergio pushes me, my state changes. A computer state is the value of its memory bits, and computer programs determine how the computer goes from one state to the next. For example, when you hit the play button, YouTube's program started manipulating your computer's memory to show this video. Where physics has physical states and natural laws, computer science has memory states and programs. Think of the state of computer memory as a string of bits. For n bits, there are two to the n possible strings. But because we're based in classical physics, the state of the computer is just one of these states at each point in time. On each step of a classical algorithm, we go from one state to the next. For example, the logic operation shown here takes the state 000 to 110. If we were to apply the same operation again, we'd go from 110 to 010. Compared to classical states, quantum states are more rich. They can have weight in all possible classical states, a situation physicists call superposition. Each step of a quantum algorithm mixes the states into complex superpositions. For example, starting in 000, we go to a superposition of 100, 101, and 111. Then each of those three parts of the superposed state branches out to even more states. The extra complexity of quantum computers allows them to solve some problems faster than a classical computer ever could. We've discussed the computational difference between classical and quantum. But how do classical and quantum differ physically? How do we bring out quantum mechanics in our chip, which is so much bigger than the tiny atoms in which quantum mechanics was first discovered? Let's take a detailed look at classical bits at the physical level so that we can understand the physical difference between classical and quantum. Classical computer bits are stored in the presence or absence of charge on a capacitor in a circuit called dynamic RAM, or DRAM for short. If there's charge, it's a logical one. And if there's no charge, it's a logical zero. But there's more going on here. Our logical zero and one are actually made up of the presence or absence of 300,000 electrons. Why use so many? In principle, we could just use the presence or absence of one electron as our logical bit. Well, physical bits are noisy. Electrons are tiny and light, so they jiggle around and leak out of the DRAM. If we had only one electron and it were to leak out, our bit would change value, which is an error. By using lots of electrons, we're OK if a few leak out. DRAM circuits periodically check the logical level and replenish missing electrons. Encoding one logical bit in the state of so many physical bits gives classical information a level of reliability that we take for granted. We don't have to think about all those electrons bumping around when we write our programs. OK, so why can't we just put our DRAM into a quantum superposition of 0 and 1? Well, suppose we did have that superposition. It wouldn't last long. 
as soon as we do the first check to protect against a DRAM error, we'd force the bit into either zero or one, removing the quantum superposition state. In fact, that collapse happens even without us checking for errors. A single photon interacting with just one of our electrons can carry off information. When that happens, it's as if the photon observed the quantum state, and the state collapses. You can think of this as nature observing, and thus destroying, our quantum states. Errors like this are unique to quantum information. In classical computing, you might be upset if somebody peeks at your bits, but that peak doesn't completely destroy them. Note that an error occurs whenever nature observes any one of our physical bits. So while we normally stack up more physical bits for redundancy, that approach actually makes quantum errors worse. That's the main difficulty in quantum computation. The fundamental quantum constituents of matter are small and easily subjected to noise, but we can't brute force our way around that noise with redundancy because bigger systems are more subject to quantum errors. At Google, we use a technique that gets the best of both worlds. We use circuits with a huge number of electrons, but we prevent quantum errors with superconductivity. In regular metals, like with a conventional DRAM circuit, every individual electron does its own thing. As electrons move around, they can bounce off the positively charged ions of the metal, radiating vibrational waves that carry off quantum information about the electrons. This hectic, bustling cauldron of physical interactions generates a lot of quantum errors, and the information gets lost before we can use it. However, when certain metals are cooled down, their electrons join together in a single unit. The individual electrons no longer scatter, and the rate of quantum errors drops to almost zero. Our quantum bits are in fact just electrical oscillators built from aluminum, which become superconducting when cooled to below one degree Kelvin. The oscillators store tiny amounts of electrical energy. When the oscillator is in the zero state, it has zero energy. When it's in the one state, it has a single quantum of energy. The two states of the oscillator with zero or one quantum of energy are the logical states of our quantum bit, or qubit for short. Here's a picture of a superconducting qubit along with a circuit diagram. The crosses indicate Josephs and tunnel junctions, which are nonlinear superconducting inductors. We pick the resonance frequency of our oscillators to be about six gigahertz, which sets the energy difference between the zero and one states. That's a low enough frequency that we can build control electronics from readily available commercial parts, but also high enough that the ambient thermal energy doesn't scramble the oscillation and introduce errors. Six gigahertz corresponds to 300 millikelvin. Fortunately, refrigerators that get to 15 millikelvin are relatively standard commercial products. For comparison, outer space is about 2.5 kelvin. I think it's cool that the cryostats in our lab are colder than deep space. Now let's take a minute to make a few comments on how superconducting qubit architecture differs from conventional computers. In a conventional computer, memory and logic processing are separated into the RAM and CPU. When we want to do a computation, we first move the data from the RAM to the CPU. Then the circuits in the CPU do the computation. And finally, the resulting data is written back to RAM. In quantum computing with superconducting qubits, we can't afford the errors that would come from moving the data around. Instead, we build a grid of qubits, each one connected to its neighbors. The qubits stay put, and we do logic operations by sending control signals into individual qubits or pairs of qubits. Now that you have a basic picture of superconducting qubits, Let's take a look at one of the challenges that we're still working on. Superconductivity greatly reduces errors, but there are still some. For example, the electrons flowing in the oscillator interact with charged particles in the surroundings, leading to errors. Suppose there were a charged ion inside the metal of our qubit. The oscillating energy in the qubit can transfer into that ion, causing the qubit's logic state to flip, thus creating an error. 
Improving the qubit fabrication process to reduce these atomic imperfections is a big part of our research. Over the last several years, improvements in microfabrication techniques have decreased our qubit error rates a lot, and we're still improving. In this video, we focus on the idea that information is physical. We discussed the physical incarnation of classical and quantum computer bits. We introduced quantum errors and explained why we need superconductivity to eliminate those errors. If you'd like to know more, you can leave questions in the comments section below. It's important to me that you can understand the physical aspects of quantum computation as clearly as possible. I'm also pretty active on Physics Stack Exchange. You can find great questions and answers there too. Thank you.